friends, how's everybody doing? Uh, Stephen McWhorter here, my beautiful wife Tara. We're excited to get to worship with our Commonwealth City Church family this morning. Thank you to Kurt and Andrew for reaching out and asking us to do this. We're insanely honored. And uh, I know that we're not physically together, but virtually we are together. <laughs> we're in the future. But, uh, you know, even though we're not together, and I know that things are insane right now, I want to begin to speak to what is going on in the earth right now, other than just to say uh, the most powerful thing and most important thing I, we can do right now as a body, though we're not together, is to worship um, together. Because there's this oneness when we do this in the spirit, where we join with heaven all together at once and just bring him glory and so right now, let's just pray and then let's just enter in together. Father, we love you. We thank you, Jesus, that you're real, that you're here with us now, with all of us, wherever we are. Your presence is so real. Would you awaken our senses, God, in the midst of all this um, just craziness, God, waken our senses to you. I believe you're calling us into a place of intimacy, but even though like everything's kind of stopped, we still are so good at finding ways of making ourselves busy and not spending time with you. It's amazing. But will you just begin to awaken our senses to you this morning, God? Would you begin to bring revival into our homes, Jesus? We long for you, Father. We will not be removed. We will not be torn from uh, where we are with you, God, that this season of what is going on in the earth will not define uh, us in a negative way. It will define your bride in glory, God. It will define your bride in a way that brings you glory, Jesus. We just crown you. Thank you. 
Commonwealth City Church. We get to continue worshiping now through our tithes and our offerings and a time of giving. And as we do, I want to invite you into something because I realized this week that like you and I have the opportunity to get to trust in the Lord in a way that honestly most of us never have in our lives. You know, years ago, um, a lot of y'all know some of my story. Uh, the Lord called me into a unique season, unique time where I got to be homeless for a while and about three years. And I remember that actually was kind of all through the season of a recession about 12 years ago. And uh, it was really unique, even as I've been looking back on that the past couple weeks, just thinking about what it looks like to depend on the Lord more than I depend on the financial structures around me. And the opportunity that we have today kind of takes us back to Malachi. Malachi was the very last prophet who wrote before Jesus arrived. So 
400 years before the coming of Christ, Malachi, the very last prophetic utterance in the Old Testament. And in that book, he says something really weird. That actually, like every other place in the Bible, there's going to be this, there's, there's going to be this principle, this do not test God. But Malachi says, that's right, but with one exception. And in that he says, test me in this. Test me in the way you give your money. See if I don't open up the floodgates of heaven. I don't open up the windows and just pour blessing out. All right, so that's a really cool thought. But right before that, there's a thought that's a little, a little less, uh, a little less palatable to us, and it's kind of heartbreaking. And it says, "Thus says the Lord of hosts." And there's this four-word phrase that I read this week that really just like, who kind of took my breath away. And God says to the people of Israel, "You are robbing me." When I heard that, I was like, man, Lord, like, gosh, call me out if there's any place, any place in me that's robbing you. And guys, we can think about that really, really mathematical and the way that we give and percentages and things like that. But ultimately, I think what God's talking about is a place of trust. As we're in a, we're in a unique time in, in history, a unique time where everything outside looks like it's just going wild. And especially in a lot of ways, financially. And I realize that right now it would be really, really easy and somewhat even logical to say, whew, I'm going to kind of pull back the reins on the way that I give. And now keep in mind, I'm not just telling you this to be like, give to Commonwealth City Church. I would love that. I would love for you to give to your local community. I promise we're going to steward it really well. We're going to give. Um, we're going to give in submission and obedience to the heart of God. But I want to tell you something a little bit more important than that. Guys, right now, there's more unemployment than there's ever been. There's like more worry and concern financially than probably any point that anybody watching this video has ever been alive. And right now, more than any point in your life, you get the chance and you have the opportunity to profess and to say to your father, God, I trust you. I trust you not because of what I see in the bank account or not because of what I hope is coming in, but I trust you because you've promised that you are going to be my provision you are going to be my supply, and you are going to give me everything that I need. So there's going to be some opportunities for you to, um, they'll be pop up on the screen, number you can text, ways that you can give. But guys, more than giving of your money to a local body right now, I want to ask you, I want to ask you to really look at your heart. And more than, more than whatever percentage you want to give of, of what you have in your bank account, I would ask you this, regardless of what percentage of money you give, Look at your heart and ask God, call me out if I'm not giving you 100% of my trust. Because guys, that's what he wants. And he died for the privilege of watching us trust him. So right now, if you would, just kind of bow your head and close your eyes wherever you are. And let's go into a time of prayer. Lord, even as I say that, you know, just those, those four words that really hit me this week, like you are robbing me. I just, I'm asking you, Lord, like, pray whatever places that that I would lack trust that you will call me out because I don't want to rob you of trust whatever places Lord that I'm that I'm fearing something I I ask you to call me out because I don't want to rob you of fear because the only the only place that fear rightly goes is the fear of the Lord Father when it comes to dependence and faith I, I just ask you to call out the places that I'm robbing you when it comes to finances or whatever else there could, whatever the category I could put in there, just ask you, Lord, call out the places where we're robbing you and invite us to give you our whole heart, to love you just like your word commissions us with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And Father, in light of that, in light of that, Lord, I just ask, invite us. Invite us into everything that your cross, your resurrection, and your shed blood accomplished for us. We love you, Lord, and we trust you, but not just because we have some kind of like blind faith. We trust you because you deserve it and because you've earned our trust. You have been ever faithful, ever loving, ever consistent, never leaving, never forsaking, never breaking a promise. And I just ask you, Father, right now, regardless of what percentage you have us give of our money, I ask you, Lord, Commission us, empower us to give 100% of our trust. We love you. It's in your name. Amen. Hey, good morning, guys. This is Butch and Pam. Just a, 
uh, here in our living room, wanted to uh, start this service off with uh, inviting you into a time of prayer. We wish we could see all of your faces. Oh, <laughs> this extrovert is struggling not getting to look at you. Even um, the introverts are struggling. But we want you to know how much we love you and this at least has given us additional prayer time and I hope all of us are taking advantage of that. Last week I was so encouraged by Austin and Maddie oh, yeah. encouraging us to um, call out praises to God, even in ABC order, to bring up new things. I have a tendency to say some of the same things over and over just because I love saying that to the Lord, but that was so encouraging to get to call out the abundant and bold God. I've done that every day, I think, this week. Two words I'd never said uh, to Him quite like that. And it, it's just been so much fun. And thank you for sharpening us, Austin and Maddie. Um, so we want to invite you to make sure you begin with praise. If the Lord is appropriately in our minds on the throne where He belongs, then our prayers will just be strengthened with so yeah. much more faith. And in saying that, I want to uh, share a scripture from Psalm 145, 1 through 3. And it's, this is in the ESV version. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day, I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is our Lord and greatly to be praised. Amen. And his greatness, it's unsearchable. That is the God we serve. That is the God we trust with all of our petitions. That is the God that we all are trusting with each other and with the whole body of Christ and those yet to be the body. Yeah, you know, and I was thinking that when David faced Goliath, the reason he was able to have that victory is because he was adoring God. He was mm -hmm. placing God in the proper place. Mm -hmm. And the next thing is thanksgiving, not just uh, who God is, which is a, the place to start for mm -hmm. sure, mm -hmm. uh, but reminding ourselves of the things God has done. If we're going to pray in faith, we need to be reminded of the way God has answered. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I love today we got that text about Jacob Heil and the prayer mm -hmm. board there at the, at the hospital. Yeah. And, uh, that is such an example of having a heart of faith mm -hmm. and, and, and a heart of thanksgiving. You know, I, I think in these times, it's easy to look at all the things we don't have and all mm -hmm. the things we can't do. But have you thought about thanking God for technology, mm -hmm. you know, which usually in churches, I'm an old pastor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, usually in churches, we're whining about technology and the way Satan has hijacked it, but God is redeeming it in unbelievable ways right now. Mm -hmm. The fact we have refrigerators full of food when uh, there's a whole nation in India that not only is there no place to shop, but they have no money to shop, pretty much as a country. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we should go from adoration to thanksgiving to get ourselves in the proper mindset of remembering God has been at work in amazing ways, mm -hmm. even during this time of crisis. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, with petitions, because even as Butch talks about India, oh. just we can't even fathom what they're going through, and we need yeah. to make sure daily we're bringing them before the Lord. Um, and not, of course, just them, but all of us. I mean, if there's ever been a time to cry out for awakening, that the way Satan wants to sweep through with the coronavirus, yeah. God wants to th sweep through with his spirit. Oh man, awakening needs to be on the tip of our tongues, on the beginning, middle, and ending of our prayers. And uh, just asking God to do a work where he is more elevated than anything that Satan could ever drag onto the table. I always say, whatever Satan throws on the table, God has the trump card and part of petitioning God is asking him to show off yeah and, and, and in addition to that I mean you know I'm, I'm all about foreign missions because God has given me the, the privilege of having a lot of friends around the world 
But also, we have a lot of friends in our church and, and those that are connected to the church. You're in the medical field. Mm. And so we want you to take some time this morning to, yes. to pray for those medical folks. You know, a number of years ago, what got me involved in storing was a, a trip to Haiti with the medical disaster relief team after the earthquake. And when I got back home, I really suffered from some PTSD because it just I wasn't expecting to see all those bodies and to deal with death on you know such a personal level and and it's caught me by surprise mm. and so I, I think we need to be lifting these folks up you know our government is telling us that there's going to be numbers of folks uh, who are not going to make it through this there's going to be a lot of hard decisions our, our medical staff's going to have to make they need the Lord to walk with them through that. Mm -hmm. And as a church, we need to be praying that God would give us the wisdom to be there uh, mm -hmm. for those individuals, even the ones that might not know the Lord, mm -hmm. to do some ministry and help with healing. Mm -hmm. And we also need to pray for our politicians, mm -hmm. that they would have wisdom, mm -hmm. regardless of whether they're in our, uh, you know, in our political ball field or not. They should still be prayed for. That's a command of Scripture. Mm -hmm. I have heard uh, you younger generation often talk about binging on Netflix or something like that, um, but this is a time that we get to binge on the Lord and how grateful we are for His kindness to us. So we invite you this morning to, uh, uh, there's going to be a, a, a slide pull up here in just a moment. As that pulls up, take some time, hit pause, take some time to pray, adore the Lord for who He is, thank Him for what He has done, and then pray, not just for our own personal needs, but for the needs of those around us. Mm -hmm. And listen, there's no hurry. It's not like you're going someplace to eat when this is over, right? Yeah, last week, I think we hit pause for almost 45 minutes, Woo -hoo. and uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, do it. Do it. So thanks a lot, guys. Cannot wait till we can get together and have a big group hug. Yeah. God bless. Enjoy the rest of the service. Hey, Commonwealth, it's a joy to be with you today. Normally, we would be uh, celebrating Palm Sunday together. Um, and even if you're not watching this on Sunday, that, that's what this moment would certainly celebrate. We would see kiddos running around, laying down the palm branches and, and singing Hosanna. We probably would do that with our kids' ministry even. But this week is certainly a little different, um, as is our, all of our routines and rhythms, as we find ourselves yet again um, kind of watching this on our own or, or watching this with, with our family or, or even maybe just by ourselves. Um, but where we are in, in the story of, of our actual move to Easter, this being Palm Sunday, next week being Easter Sunday, it's also where we find ourselves in the book of John. Now we've kind of stepped out of, of preaching John for the last couple of weeks as we've spoken directly to how how all of our, our redirection and realignment of our world and, and tried to speak truth to that. And, and even in the last week, it was so incredible to see so many testimonies uh, of God's faithfulness and so many testimonies um, of just what he's doing and how he's, he's answering prayers and, and, and his deeds are displayed in the lives of our people. And it's been incredible to see that we still are getting to see um, from one another in our prayer times, in our communion times, and, and in our commissioning times to, to hear stories of God's faithfulness. But today we're going to get back into, into our uh, study of the book of John. And so we're going to be in John chapter 19. I'm about to read a lot of scripture for you today. Um, John chapter 19, verses 17 through 42. 
as we cover the ground um, leading up to the moment of resurrection, which Kurt's going to invite us into next week as we unpack John 20. But today in John 19, verses 17 through 42, uh, if you have your Bibles, you're invited to follow along with me, um, but it'll also be on the screen. It says this, And he went out, bearing his own cross, to a place called the Place of the Skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather write this man said, I am the king of the Jews. But Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic, but the tunic was seamless. And so woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things by standing, but the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus, where his mother, where his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken so they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus they see, they, and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you may also believe. But these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And another said, they will look on him who they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take the body of Jesus. So Pilate gave him permission. Now he came and he took away his body. Nicodemus also, who, who earlier had come to see Jesus at night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for um, our time together today. We thank you for all that you have invited us into, into your word, into this truth. Um, God, we just pray that we see this story of uh, crucifixion not just be a moment of history that informs our faith, um, but a moment today that transforms our faith. Uh, God, we pray that, that we live in light of the cross and of the resurrection, and we pray that you just uh, speak to our hearts. You speak that second sermon over devices or televisions or laptops, that you, you speak that second sermon louder than anything that, that we could preach or proclaim um, to give us eyes to see and ears to hear your truth this, this day. In your holy and precious name, Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. So there are tons of things going on here that we could teach concerning the resurrection. In fact, the resurrection, or not the resurrection, the crucifixion. The crucifixion is, is, the one, is one of the stories that every single gospel account obviously is going to detail and describe and, and, sh and shed a light on. And, and so we could go through every single gospel account and offer you different perspectives on the crucifixion. 
Uh, there are scientific perspectives. There are, are um, perspectives of understanding exactly what the, the science of crucifixion and execution were for the Romans. Um, there are medical perspectives. In fact, when you see the moment where it talks about him being pierced and blood and water coming out of his side, like there is a, a medical perspective that explains why that, that was uh, a, a sign that he had died. In fact, it even, John even draws attention. He said, the guy that, that is telling this, that's bearing witness to this, uh, his testimony is true. Basically, you can take his word for it that Jesus actually died. You can take his word for it. There's a medical perspective that we could talk about. There are conversations that happened on the cross that some other gospel accounts point to. Things like his interaction with the, the, um, the thieves to his right and to his left, uh, but also his interaction with the centurion. There's his final sermon in Aramaic where, where he speaks out um, the beginning of Psalm 22, the, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, and, and the reason that most of the authors still even acknowledge that in Aramaic is because it would have had a contextual uh, um, just, it would have, have gripped people. It would have been a memorable moment in the lives of every single person there. In the same way that, that you and I might hear quotes like four score and seven years ago, or, or, or December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. Is, our minds go to moments in history, so their minds at the moment that Jesus declares, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We could talk about all those different um, perspectives of the, of the crucifixion. And in fact, we should. But we don't have time to cover all of those today. So even this week, as, as you are in this Passion Week leading up to, to Easter Sunday and Good Friday, um, we would love to, to invite you to even do some of those, that research yourself. In fact, we might even put out some resources, that, so, some articles or some, some blogs or even some books to check out or podcasts that might shed some more light on, on all the aspects of the crucifixion. But today we're going to kind of stay in John's account and focus on a few things. Um, and, and we're going to focus on, on really the fact that, that John's account is a little bit different than the other accounts. Much like John's gospel is different from the other three gospels in the sense that it's not called one of the synoptics, um, meaning that the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all kind of run um, pretty much a, a very similar path in terms of, of stories and chronologies uh, in, in sermons and messages that Jesus spoke, all the different signs and wonders. But John's gospel set up uniquely different. And it is always set up to, to encourage and invite us to believe and to believe in the Christ and to see him as the, the son of God and the savior of the world. And, and yet when we see this story of the crucifixion, we really see not a narrative that is full of details, but a narrative that showcases suffering, much like all the crucifixion narratives. We see this narrative of suffering starting in verse 17. And, and it is Jesus having taken the abuse of the flogging and the torment uh, from, from, from chapter 18 before, or earlier in chapter 19, we, we, see the, we see Jesus having taken physical abuse. We see him emotionally abused. We see him uh, mentally abused. We, we see even, even Pilate mocking him, like a psychological abuse, that on the cross it is written, King of the Jews. The, the Jewish leaders actually were upset about this, as you saw in the text. They actually wanted it to say, this man said he was the King of the Jews, but that wasn't good enough for the Roman official. Pilate, the Roman official, said this is the King of the Jews. There's another way that, that that had been said throughout the Old Testament, that this was the God of Israel. And the Romans, in the midst of their power, in the midst of their control, in the midst of, in the, midst of the ferocity and the advancement of their kingdom, that day, at that place of the skull, God was going to be killed. The King of the Jews, the hope of the Jews, on display and dead. And we see this being written in every language Aramaic and Greek and Latin so that everyone that was attending would see the Romans that day. They killed God. And we see this narrative of suffering. But it's not just Jesus' suffering. In fact, there's an interesting inclusion in verse 25 where Jesus has this moment where he's on the cross. And in John's account, he only says three sentences. 
um, or really speaks three times. You could say it's technically four sentences. If you have a Bible with red letters and you go through John 19, 17 through 42, you only see um, three different moments where there are red letters. And this is the first one. In verse 25, he says, woman, behold your son. And then to John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the author of this book, he says, behold your mother. This is the moment that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John are closest to suffering. In fact, when you read this, it says in verse 25, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary Magdalene, and John. Standing by the cross of Jesus. Now, what's interesting about that is that in every other gospel account, it talks about those people being present at the crucifixion, but being distant. Now, does that mean there's a crucifixion between John and Matthew, Mark, and Luke? No. I just think this was a moment where John wanted to highlight there was a moment that they were close to the cross. If you've ever been to a funeral visitation, even in our modern understanding of of a funeral home, there's a moment where you're up by the casket, be consoling the family that's closest, and then there's a moment where you're away, you're standing at a distance, you've created some space, maybe catching up with some other people that you're seeing at at the funeral home or at the visitation for that you haven't seen in a while. And so there's this moment where the family of Jesus is really close to the cross, but as condemnation and shame. And we know that the crucifixion would do that. Like the crucifixion, anyone that had been crucified actually affects families for generations because of the shame that it brings on and the shame that it induces. And so as the family of Jesus started to feel that shame, I am sure that they distanced themselves. But this is a moment when they were close And Jesus looks at his mom and he says, behold your son. And he looks at his, one of his best friends and he says, behold your mother. Now, why did John highlight this? It's because Jesus always speaks to those who suffer. He always does. Even though he was suffering, he always speaks to those who suffer. In fact, because he is the suffering servant, he knows how to best speak. To those who suffer. It's not ironic that the same author that authored the story of Lazarus reminds us here that the same Savior that cried tears, Jesus wept with his friend who had lost her brother, is the same Savior that on the literal cross of his own crucifixion looks to the eyes of his family and his friends and says, Behold one another love one another, take one another, be close to one another. He always speaks to suffering. In fact, Isaiah 53 would say that he was despised and rejected by men. And this should be a great reminder to us in our suffering of how he meets us in it, that he, in Isaiah 53, is a man of sorrows. He is acquainted with grief. Jesus always speaks to suffering. Our world today has had a suffering moment. In fact, many of us would consider what we're living in right now to be a season of suffering. But I want to be honest with you, over the first few weeks of of this new kind of coronavirus rhythm and routine, I have been tempted to always answer the question of how am I living in this current moment through the process of my individual self? You know, for me personally, um, it's not been all bad. I've been able to scale back. I've, I've read things I've not been able to read for a long time. I've been able to get some projects around my house. I've been more intentional uh, over even digital platforms with people that, that maybe I've not been as consistent staying in touch with. I've had creative expressions in my free time. I've been reading and praying and, and walking more and, and, and being more in tune with, with day-to-day life. And at the end of that all, it's like, well, that doesn't sound like that's suffering much at all. But I'm going to be honest with you. It wasn't until earlier this week that the switch flipped for me. What did coronavirus mean to me? That's the wrong question. The question I started asking myself is, what does coronavirus mean for us? And when I start answering it through an us mentality, when I start answering it through a corporate perspective or a corporate worldview of how this virus is affecting not just Andrew, but our city, our state, our nation, and ultimately the entire world, my heart got heavy. As my perspective changed, my heart changed. And it got heavy and it got burdened because I started seeing and reading and, and, and thinking of it through the stories of people that have loved ones that are um, infected with this illness, of, of the stress and the burden 
of our caregivers, our doctors and our nurses, uh, and what they're facing every single day, and in some places even more intensely than others. I got to hear hearing stories even of how their, their colleagues and co-workers were now being infected with this virus that they were fighting. I've heard stories of economic strain, and the reality is that the economic strain that ultimately affects all of us affects those of us that have the least. It affects those that have the least the most. And as I started to put on those lenses and hear stories of our, our brother Guna in India that talks about that if, if the nation of India, many of whom are impoverished, if, if they start to really practice social isolation and social distancing, then what might happen would be welcoming starvation if ultimately it's choosing which way they wanted uh, to be afflicted. Do they want to starve to death? Or do they want to face a global virus? And as I started to think about this through different lenses and through different perspectives and started to make the perspective less about me and more about we, then I started to understand that we live in a moment of global suffering. There's some people in our midst that are suffering because important dates uh, in their life are changing, whether those are, are graduations or, or weddings. There are some people in our midst that are suffering because a friend or a family member has had a virus. There are some that are suffering because of the economic strain, but all of us are suffering, and I've not even talked about the deaths yet. When I started to watch the death numbers from a global standpoint, even to a local standpoint of, of hearing our governor say it's a tough day as he rattles off some numbers to seeing that the United States is now facing death tolls in the, that, are, that are reaching four digits and, and going even higher, I'm sure, in the coming days to see the graphic that our own White House puts out that if we do a good job with this, if we meet all of our um, suggestions and recommendations that we might as a nation be able to keep under a quarter of a million people passing away at the result of this virus. And when I started to think about the deaths that are going to mount up over the coming days, weeks, and months, my heart started to get even heavier because I am concerned that many of those lives, many of those lives might not, might not just be lost on this earth. They might be lost for all eternity. John Piper says a quote. It's been something I've kept in front of me for the past week that says, we as the people of God should care about all suffering, but we should care mostly about eternal suffering. Why? Because Jesus cares about all suffering, but he cares mostly about eternal suffering. He greets the ladies at the cross and the disciple John the same way he greets us in our momentary suffering. He is with us. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us, near to us, close to us. But he also meets them at the cross with the display of his life that says, I don't just care about your momentary suffering. I care about your eternal suffering. He cares about our eternal suffering at the cross. He lets out this phrase. It's actually one of the others that he mentions in the, in the Gospel of John. It is finished. To tell us die. What is? What did Jesus finish? A couple weeks ago, we mentioned that Elijah built an altar or rebuilt an altar of the Lord to see God's fire fall down from heaven and and to be on display that he is God uh, and that no one else is. And, and likewise, I even gave a teaser a couple weeks ago that Jesus was going to forever rebuild the altar of the Lord, one that couldn't be torn down or trampled over or built over or destroyed. And he was going to do that in, in the form of the cross. And so when he says from the cross, it is finished, uh, it is finished, that moment on the cross becomes the, the moment um, when his better offer of a life with him, a life for eternity, a life believing in him, a life um, restored and redeemed and ransomed by, by the work of Jesus. It's that moment that his better offer is actually made good for us. So three things happen in that it is finished moment. And I want, I want to get through these so, so that we can see the, the finality of exactly what he was finishing. Three things. First of all, he took away our sin. He took away God's wrath from us. And he bridged the distance between us and God or us and the Father. Now, certainly there were more than three things happened. Again, I said I'm not going to be able to preach every crucifixion uh, uh, story today uh, or every bit of theology that comes 
in this work of justification on the cross of Christ. Can't preach them all today, but I'm going to talk about these three. First and foremost, at the very beginning of John, we see in John 1.29, John the Baptist actually say, points at Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. On that cross was the forever sacrificial Lamb of God. Who needs him? All of us do. Real quick, where you are right now, I want to invite you to do a little exercise. If you've ever told a lie or been deceitful in any way, raise your hand. Just go ahead and raise your hand. You'll know that my hand's up. Trace, who's here filming this with us, his hand is up. Um, if, if you're sitting by yourself, it might look awkward if you just have the hand raised. But if you've got anybody else in the room, uh, kids, husband, wife, um, friend, neighbor, anything like that, I expect everybody's hand to be raised. Now, why is this an exercise that we're doing? Well, what's this? The fact that we recognize that, that we have a tendency to, to do something that's, that's wrong, like, like tell a lie or be deceitful, it should be just the starting point for the recognition of our own sin. Who needs Jesus? Everybody with their hand raised does. So kiddos, if you're watching, your mom and dad, they need Jesus. They're not just good on their own. They need Jesus. Husbands, wives, if you're watching, your, your spouse needs Jesus. Like they're not just, they're not... Their attraction, your attraction to one another is not what they need. They need Jesus. Parents, is your kids raise your hand? Like, they're the most sweet, adorable things in the world, but they need Jesus. Every single one of us need Jesus. And because we have the presence of sin in our life, and it's far greater than even a white lie that we can tell and kind of chuckle about in a raise our hand exercise, but because we have the presence of God in our life, it's an indication that we need Jesus. In fact, Tim Keller writes, the prerequisite for receiving the grace of God is to know that you need it. The prerequisite for receiving the grace of God is to know that you need it. And why do you need it? Why do you need the grace of God? Why do you need him to take away our sin? Because God's wrath burns against our sin. It burns against sin. In Exodus 32, it says that his anger is hot and burns against sin. And this is a moment where, where he's burning against the, the sin of the people of God right after they have been shown a, a Ten Commandments in which to live and immediately break them. And his anger burns against sin. And it does so righteously. He cannot stand sin. In fact, he cannot even be in the presence of sin. His holiness makes no room for sin. He is always angry toward it, which sounds like really bad news for us because we've already raised our hand. And the fact is, we raised our hand about like, oh yeah, we've told a lie. We've been deceitful. But there are secret places in my life and in yours. There are motives. There are attitudes. There are desires that if we're honest, we don't want anybody to see. That they display the rotten side of humanity, not the redeemed side. And the fact of the matter is that God knows every single one of those things equally as much as the confession of having told the lie and raising our hand. And his wrath doesn't wink at any of those spots in our life. In fact, it righteously burns against it. So how is this good news? Because at the cross of Jesus Christ, him taking away our sin means that he also took away God's wrath. That God's wrath that was intended for me and you was, was intercepted by Jesus. And, and the wrath that would, the God's wrath that would rightly burn against my sin and yours fully was poured out on his son on the cross as a replacement for mine and your sin, not just for our past sin, but for our future sin once and forevermore because of our faith and trust in the work of Jesus Christ. Our shortcomings, our failures, our dirty hidden thoughts and places, they no longer condemn us or speak shame over our life. Instead, the righteousness of Jesus rewards us, declares us faithful and righteous, and speaks um, identity over our lives. And so that's what we get at the it is finished moment. He took away our sin. He took away God's wrath. And, and, and let me just give you a scripture earlier I read from Isaiah 53. Let me continue in that as to where we see this. Um, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. 
and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to his own way, but the Lord laid upon him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. So he takes away our sin. He takes away God's wrath, and he does one more thing. He removes the distance between us and God. In John chapter 14, we preached this a while ago. It says that, um, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except through him. Now, he's the only way to get there. And, and we, we, talk about, we talk about having a relationship with, the, with God as something that, that happens only to believers. The reality is, is that every single human that's ever been created has a relationship with God. How they relate to God is, what's the, is what the question is. And, and ultimately what we see is that every single person defaultly will relate to God as a righteous judge over their life. Every single person will. We know this. We see this in scripture. Jesus talks about this mo- multiple times. He talks about um, not concerning whether we can live or we can die, but, but not being scared of that, but being scared of the one who can't just kill the body, but can take the soul and to throw it in a place of outer darkness, to throw it in a place of hell. He talks about recognizing God as a, as a righteous judge and that every single one of us will have to face that. But the work of the cross says that he changes the relationship. Previously, all I had was to know God as a judge. But now, through the work of Jesus, I can see God as a loving father. That that he is the way, the truth, and the life that no one comes to the father except through him. With our belief and our confession and our repentance and, and trusting the finished work of Jesus. And not our works, but trusting his work invites me to crawl into the lap of a loving father and not keep my distance out of fear or shame or, or, or failure to meet his standards. It invites me to approach the throne of grace with confidence, as the book of Hebrews would say, because of the finished work of the Son, Jesus Christ. It, it, it says that I don't have to walk in condemnation anymore, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that there is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ. It changes the nature of my relationship, that God is not the judge that I face. He's the father that I commune with because of my belief and trust in the finished work of Jesus. He, the loving father, is now near to us and his spirit is in us. But with that recognition that the work on the cross takes away my sin, takes away God's wrath, takes away our sin, takes away God's wrath and invites us into a new relational standing with the God of all creation. There's an urgency that comes with that, isn't there? There's an urgency. If we're going to be people that care about all suffering, but mostly care about eternal suffering, then there's an urgency that there are many in this world who might be facing Uh, Death in an entirely new capacity now that it's on every news channel and in front of us every single day. There's a new urgency to say that we don't grieve like people that don't have a hope. We grieve like people that have a hope. We have a hope. We have good news. We have the best news in the world. There are people that have to know this. They have to know that their bad works are, are, are not corrected by an, an over, overabundance of good works. They have to know that the sin in their life invites God's wrath. They have to know that there's a lamb, a perfect spotless lamb that crawled on a cross, that took the, the sin of the world away. They have to know that there's a king that invites them to see and know how loving and how restorative and how redeeming God really can be. They have to know these things. And the way that they know them starts with how we hope. Last week we spoke in Romans chapter 5 that that as we persevere and as we grow our character, that it produces a hope in the world. That hope's not for us. That hope's for everybody else. As, as, As you in this season of suffering grow in your knowledge and in your pursuit And in your identity as as someone marked by the gospel of Jesus, you give off a hope. As I do that, I give off a hope. I display to the world a hope that doesn't disappoint. I grieve like people with a new hope in Jesus. I have hope. And it's that hope. You have a hope. I have a hope. We have a hope. It's that hope that, that 
really speaks a better word to our nation, to our world right now. You know, in conclusion, I want to think about just the gravity of that moment at the cross. Uh, that sign was, was, cruci- was, was nailed to the top. Here is the king of the Jews, the God of Israel. We're killing him today. And if you were a bystander, just put it in your, in your uh, frame of reference. If you were somebody that had watched Jesus from a distance for the three years of his ministry, or even for the, for the time that he was in Jerusalem leading up to his death, as you watched his signs and wonders displayed, as you heard of the healings and, and the miracles that had happened, as you heard about a guy that showed up and fed thousands of people with a small um, child's lunch, as you heard about a guy who had walked on water and had calmed a storm, as you heard about a guy that had, that had called a man out of the grave, as you heard about all these things and you wondered, is this really God? Is this really the king? Is this really the Messiah? Is this really the chosen one? If you happened to be in Jerusalem on that Friday and saw him nailed to a cross and saw him pierced in the side and saw water and blood rush out of his body, you would have probably thought, as would I have thought, no. I guess that wasn't him. I guess that's really not the king. I guess God really isn't in control. Even if you're one of his disciples that had bought in and had started to follow him passionately and and understood a new thing about the kingdom of God uh, itself and and the king uh, being enthroned and you see Jesus die, would you have been led to question if God was in control? Because I probably would have. How can God be in control when the God-man is killed dead? How can God be in control when Jesus is crucified and killed? How can God be in control and this tragedy still happen? In fact, we might be asking that exact same question about our globe right now. How can God be in control? Thousands of people, millions of people infected potentially, Thousands of people facing, have already died and thousands more facing the earth. How can God be in control? Well, friend, as we look back from our perspective now, was God out of control when Jesus was on the cross? No. No, he wasn't. God was not out of control even when the Son of God died. And he's not out of control in whatever it is that you're facing and you're suffering. He's not out of control because the pandemic is running wild on the face of the planet. He's not, he wasn't out of control then, and he's not out of control now. And because we have that hope, we have to declare that hope as, as loudly as we can, even if it's just in our, in our personal lives, in our families, in our digital connections with people, in our prayers for people. He's never been out of control, and he's not out of control now. I'm going to end with a story. Um, we, uh, I was having a conversation this week as we've been thinking about what this means to deal with the coronavirus and, and even as a, as a church, as, a, as just a citizen, as myself and trying to think about a, a more corporate perspective as I mentioned earlier, um, was having a conversation with my dad. So dad, if you're watching this, thanks, thanks for that and I love you. Um, but we were having a conversation and he said, he just, he was on speakerphone actually talking to me and Kurt and um, just encouraging us, and we were talking about the ways that both of our churches are kind of responding to this right now, and uh, he said, you know, I, I felt the Lord ask me a question. This was between God and my dad. Jeff, do you have a, is there a figure that you think gets you through this? You know, and, and immediately when I hear that number, or when I hear that word figure, I'm thinking financial, which is what my dad was thinking through. Is there a, you know, from, from the, the strain on our economy to, you know, to the people that are facing that. To, I know he was in a position that was maybe facing um, laying off some, some workers. And as many of you have been, as many of us have been, cons- you know, either affected by that or, or, or fearing what's coming. And, um, you know, is there, is there a number, is there a figure, is there a, a figure that can get you through this? And he felt very quickly that the Lord remind him that the figure that gets us through this season It's not a dollar amount, it's not a president, it's not a governor, it's not a vaccine. The figure that gets us through this season is the cross of Jesus Christ. And then next week, we know that that figure does get us through 
because the grave didn't hold him down. And we get to celebrate that together. There's no number on a paycheck that gets you through coronavirus. There is no number in a vital sign of, a, of, a, of someone that's facing this illness that gets you through. There's no vaccine or leader that gets you through, but there is a savior that gets you through this coronavirus. And I want to invite you to know him. I want to invite you to worship him. And I want you to invite, invite, him, invite you to see him as such and to see him as someone that cares about suffering, but mostly about eternal suffering. And so as we go from this place today, as we come to a moment where Ben and Blair introduce us to the table today, let's take eat and remember the body and blood broken and shed by Jesus for us. But let's also take eat and participate that we're a people that have been seen through whatever hardship, whatever fear, whatever worry, whatever anxiety we face and we're seen through by the work of the cross. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that your cross sees us through, that when you said it is finished, you took away sin, you took away wrath, and you invited us into a perfect loving, perfect loving relationship um, with the Father. We thank you, Jesus, that through your work, we have better news and a better hope, and we have exactly what it takes to be seen through this and every season we face. God, may we live that way with our eyes on the cross. Um, grow our endurance, grow our character, but may we be a people of hope. In your holy and precious name, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Hey, Calm City. My name is Blair Connor, and this is my husband, Ben. And we want to invite you guys to partake in communion with us today. As family of Jesus, you're invited to the table to take and eat of his body that was broken for us and a drink of his blood that was poured out for our sins. We do this in remembrance of his sacrifice on our behalf. If you do not follow Jesus, then take something better than a cup and a piece of bread. Take hold of Jesus himself, who longs to be in a relationship with you. He alone can satisfy you. I'm gonna share some scripture from John 6, 53 and 54. So Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So before we enter this time of communion, uh, let's pray over it, uh, communion, and then uh, we'll see you guys hopefully in the coming weeks. Who knows? So let us pray. Dear Lord, uh, we just come to you now, uh, just in all of who you are. You're a God always in control, and a great God of power that we cannot comprehend. Dear Lord, we just pray now, bless this bread, bless this juice, and may it just be a remembrance to us of your sacrifice on that day that seemed like uh, you weren't present. But dear Lord, your plan was being played out. Dear Lord, as we walk through this time uh, that is a chaos and uh, a lot of unknowing, uh, we know that nothing surprises you. So dear Lord, bless each uh, household today uh, watching this as they partake communion. Uh, and we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We love you guys and we hope to see you soon.
taking off. Death, we're breaking every agreement with death right now, Father. We're breaking every agreement with fear right now in Jesus' name. Com City, this is Micah LeMaster and my fiance Maddie T. Meyer. Um, we just wanted to take a minute to share something with you. Um, we felt led this last week to try and organize for the church body um, a fast that we want to do coming up this next Easter weekend. Um, and it really comes out of uh, some time in the Word reading through uh, specifically Matthew 9. There's a passage where Jesus describes fasting. Um, to his disciples. And he talks about how before he came, fasting was this uh, activity that the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people would do um, out of mourning, out of a desire, and an anticipation for uh, redemption with the Lord someday. But now that Jesus has come, there's this opportunity to continue fasting um, because the bridegroom uh, has come and is coming at the same time. The kingdom of God is not yet, but it is here already. Um, and so this Easter weekend, as we celebrate that coming of our King, um, we can take the time to fast, and we can take the time to pray. And I really think it's a potent time, the convergence of these two important seasons, the season of Easter and the season of this virus that we're experiencing right now, the season of separation and the season of seeing the unity uh, between God and man brought in the person of Jesus. And so, um, yeah, we're really going to try and dig into that. Um, we've got some people involved from around the city, and we're going to share a little bit more. Yeah, we're going to have <clears throat> a place on Facebook where you can share your prayer requests, and on Instagram, we're going to be posting just throughout the week um, that you can comment what you're praying for or um, what you're hopeful about, but... Um, the fast is going to start after dinner time on Friday, and then we'll be breaking our fast on Sunday morning, and then we'll be watching our services together in our own homes. <laughs> yeah, so you can um, let other people know about it. It's not just our church. We're trying to get some other people in Lexington to do it, and really what it is is it's like we're separated right now. We're not able to congregate uh, in our familiar uh, way in church, but here in this way we can gather in prayer and we can pray for each other and we can pray for our, our city, our nation, our world, um, and we can celebrate uh, the coming of the risen Christ who remains on the throne, who remains alive, and in this season where we're fearful, we can have hope and we can have confidence in him. So um, yeah, join us in fasting this coming Saturday. <laughs> Hey church, this is Danny Curry. I get to serve as campus minister at the BCM and we miss having you in the building on Sundays and throughout the week.
but wanted to close out today by commissioning you into your home, into your neighborhood, into the city, and to the ends of the earth as ambassadors for Christ. And when I think of an ambassador for Christ, I think of someone who sows seeds of the gospel, someone who scatters seeds of the kingdom of God. And as I've had to to adapt as a campus minister to students being at home and not on campus and having to rely on text messages and phone calls and Zoom meetings and being stuck in my house. One scripture that's really encouraged me is Mark 4, 26 and 27. And in it, Jesus says this, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He rises and sleeps night and day and the seed sprouts and grows and he knows not how. And I find that scripture so encouraging because when I think of the constraints that are on me, uh, I realize that the kingdom of God isn't under those same constraints. The kingdom of God is still growing. God is still at work. And uh, even though I, I sleep and am stuck in my house, um, God's growing these seeds and seeds that I sowed last fall, last winter. God's at work growing those seeds now. And the call still remains to scatter seed. Uh, I think of the phone call I had with my cousin just a couple nights ago, a two hour phone call. I don't get to talk to him much, but got to share the Lord. I think of the guy from Spectrum who came over to my house to, to fix some things, got to share the Lord with him. Think of my 85 year old neighbor. He, he came, he came knocking on my door and came inside. And I asked him, I said, are you sure you want to be here? And, uh, and he did. So we, we talked and had, and had an encouraging time. And, uh, so just be encouraged, church. The call remains the same uh, to scatter seeds of the gospel as best as we can. And just uh, I'm fully expecting that when students get back to campus, um, that I'll look at them and just be amazed at the work that God did. And I'll just praise him for it. So go be sent and spent well for the gospel of Jesus Christ.